Okay, um, I'm really happy to um, start uh, the summer school on uh, dark matter direct detection and to start on the nuclear physics aspects of dark matter direct detection. Um, I would be more than happy if you have questions, just um, if you could put it in the chat, uh, which I should be able to see here on Zoom, or if you just um, uh, speak up, uh, unmute and ask a question, that's perfectly fine. Um, okay, so I'm from the TU Darmstadt and my background is nuclear theory, um, mainly uh, through effective field theories of the strong interaction. Um, so I'm not a um involved in uh, dark matter direct detection but in the nuclear physics needed for it here's an outline of the lectures of today's and tomorrow's lecture so first of all i want to say that i've been very fortunate to work with uh, um, three brilliant people on uh, nuclear physics of dark matter direct detection two former postdocs from darmstadt martin hoferricher who is now um, in bern Javier Menendez, who is in Barcelona, and Philip Close, who was an excellent PhD student in Darmstadt. And um, today's lecture, I want to cover the first three topics here. Uh, particularly, I want to introduce to you to nuclear physics itself and uh, the theory we use to describe nuclear interactions and nuclei, namely chiral effective field theory. And then I would like to take a historical path to our work on this and start first with uh, discussing the nuclear physics of spin dependent WIMP nuclear scattering. Um, and here's the key paper here, close 2013. And there's an update in our 2020 paper here. And then I would like to discuss also um, an, an, a very interesting um, channel namely inelastic scattering where nuclei are excited from the ground state, which is maybe too difficult to detect, but very, very interesting if it can be realized. And this is what we will um, do today. And tomorrow we switch to a more, um, more um, let's say a broader picture of uh, WIMPs coupling to uh, nuclei and discuss the uh, um, all possible coherent, um, so spin independent is one of them, but all possible coherent WIMP nuclear scattering channels. Um, I point you to these two papers, in particular the most recent ones, and also want to show how that has been used to provide first limits um, on WIMP pion interactions from the Xenon 1 Titan collaboration. Um, then um, let me um, make some advertisement for an additional work, a uh, recent work here, which is that paper where also there was a spin dependent update. Namely, we also looked at coherent um, elastic neutrino nuclear scattering, also using the same chiral EFT framework and nuclear responses. So if you're interested in using consistent uh, neutrino scattering rates to the dark matter nuclear scattering rates, this is covered by this paper. And then uh, we wrote a Jupyter notebook, which is available on uh, our group's website, the Chiral EFT 4DM, which is able to calculate all these responses and uh, from these also calculate read core spectra and so on. And finally, if you have any questions um, um, outside of the school or after the school, please um, uh, feel free to send me an email to my email address, which is here. Okay, let me start with the first topic, which is basically, a quick introduction to modern nuclear physics, which I think is important because uh, you will have to rely on nuclear physics for some aspects of dark matter direct detection. So um, nuclear physics concerns primarily uh, uh, the strong interaction, one of the four fundamental interactions in, of nature. And is, as you know, governed by QCD, which is the theory of quarks and gluons, which binds uh, quarks and gluons into hadrons like neutrons, protons, and they themselves form uh, nuclei, bind to nuclei. But uh, actually, all of the other four fundamental interactions of nature, the weak interaction, obviously, electrodynamics, and also gravity are very close uh, to nuclear physics. Um, so in nuclear physics, we are at the level here of the energy budget of the universe, interested in the strong interaction, which is basically what gives the mass of ordinary matter, the 5% of ordinary matter in the universe. Okay, so a big quick overview of which nuclei are bound by the strong interaction. This uh, picture here of the alpha particle already, uh, helium-4, 
Um, and you are, of course, all familiar with uh, stable nuclei because they are sort of, uh, he has um, targets for dark matter direct detection, but just to tell you that they are not just about 300 stable nuclei, but they are factor 10 more, namely 3000 nuclei that have been discovered here all in green. Um, most of them are, of course, unstable. They beta decay, for example. And uh, this paper here predicts that, in fact, uh, all, there are at least as many more nuclei that are held together by the strong interaction. And you can see here that if you look at nuclei in the nuclear chart where they are arranged as a function of proton and neutron number, all of these unknown nuclei here lie between um, the green points that have been discovered and the so-called neutron drip line, which is the heaviest possible neutron rich nuclei for a given element. Okay, so all of this, in all of this white space, there are bound nuclei by the strong interaction that exists. Um, just to tell you that this has been actually something that's really take, been taken off in the last um, 20, 30 years. Over here, you can see um, the state um, in 1993, which was 25 years ago compared to this last compilation of where all nuclei have been discovered through various channels here. And if you look at the last compilation, then you can see there have been many neutron-rich nuclei that have been synthesized in the lab and discovered um, in the last 25 years. And in fact, there are three large facilities that are either operating at Riken in Japan, um, under construction and close to operating at F, the facility for rare isotope beams at MSU, and under contract, construction and uh, set to operate in a few years, a fair facility for antipotent iron research in Darmstadt. And uh, the reason that the nuclear physicists are so excited about this is because this will basically in some regions fill in half of the territory that is unexplored of these exotic neutron rich nuclei. Okay. And uh, so you can see that this, this has also spurred the nuclear theorists to um, really refine methods that we use to describe nuclei. And that's very important to you because you want to use accurate nuclear physics information for dark matter direct detection. Um, so let me give you a little bit of a, a broader view why this is so important. Um, to quote from this Discover magazine, uh, which formulated the 11 greatest unanswered questions uh, for their top three. They basically took the energy budget pie chart and turned it into questions. What is dark matter, uh, your school? What is dark energy? And in nuclear physics, we're after the question, how were the heavy elements from iron to uranium made? Uh, these were made through a um, um, process that is called the R process. Um, which is a way of synthesizing nuclei along this uh, essentially red line here by capturing many neutrons rapidly. That's why it's called R for rapid neutron capture process before they eventually beta decay back. And I just want to show you how that works. This is a, and notice that this runs through basically a huge region that is experimentally unexplored and will be explored by future facilities. Let me show you here in a movie of how this happens. So you start in an astrophysical environment with some nuclei that are already existing here around uh, ion group nuclei here in red. And then if the movie runs, um, we have to wait for a bit. Here we go. Um, oops. There's no movie. Let me try again. So let me do the movie um, here. Let me try again this way. And then my computer doesn't like me anymore. Okay, never mind. We still skip the movie. 
you can ask me in the exercise session. Um, you basically synthesize all the heavy elements uh, along this R process path up here. And then these synthesized, freshly synthesized neutron rich nuclei beta decay back to over here and form the abundances observed in the solar system. I think this file is just so large for Zoom, that's the problem. Okay, and so basically you have a synthesis path that goes along here. You need very neutron rich environments. And so that happens either in phenomena occurring in neutron stars or in neutron star mergers. And from this decay of freshly synthesized neutron rich nuclei, from this beta decay back, one can get energy gain and this can be observed. And I just wonder, since you have also in your network, a gravitational wave school, then of course, you know that there has been, have been neutron star mergers that were observed. The first one in August 17th, 2017, with this uh, Inspiro signal here at LIGO. And also after this um, merger, there was not only a short gamma ray burst observed, but also a kilonova, so a, a faint supernova, which uh, turned uh, from blue to red over um, um, short time. And you can see here the observations from this kilonova here, which are in blue, uh, sorry, the in red points. And you can compare this to the earlier prediction here for, by Metzger and collaborators, which was a prediction which relied on the nuclear physics input by uh, nuclear physics colleagues here in Darmstadt, Arconis and Martinez Pinedo. So actually the nuclear physics that we want to tackle and the nuclear structure that we want to tackle plays not only a role for um, nuclear structure uh, or for decays, uh, for weak decays or for, for you for dark matter nuclear scattering, but it also triggers all these astrophysical light curves and it plays a key role for neutron stars. Okay, so let me come back to what we're really interested in. We want to describe nuclei for dark matter direct detection. And so we want to ask the question, well, how can we describe nuclei based on the theory of QCD? And there's essentially two paths forward. One is the um, a real direct way, namely to uh, take the theory of uh, quarks and gluon QCD and put it on uh, space-time grid and simulated using powerful lattice simulations. However, because of um, the sign problem and because of large signal to noise ratio, this is not possible at the moment, except for systems of few nucleons, which is basically here. And since you are interested in nuclei as heavy as xenon, um, that's uh, not uh, useful for you for dark matter direct detection. Instead, we use uh, to describe the nuclear chart and nuclei, not QCT directly, but we use effective field theories of the strong interaction, which have been used for many nuclei. And in fact, we think can be used for all nuclei. So what is the prime effective field theory that we use in nuclear physics? The prime effective field theory was introduced to nu in nuclear physics 30 years ago by Steven Weinberg, and it's called chiral effective field theory. And here's the implementation used today um, um, in its description of uh, nuclear forces, meaning the interactions of uh, nucleons, two nucleons, three nucleons, four nucleons in free space or inside a nucleus. And the effective field theory of Steven Weinberg basically um, writes down all possible type of interactions between neutrons and protons and organizes them in a systematic expansion, not in terms of the coupling constants, because in the strongly interacting theory, no, none of the coupling constants are small, but in terms of momenta of the nucleons. So this is a diagram for two nucleons interacting at short distances, or two nucleons interacting by exchanging a pion. And, uh, um, Weinberg predicted that if you're interested in the nucleons having low momenta, so low energy nuclear forces, then uh, the dominant interaction, the leading interaction in this momentum expansion is given by having only two nucleon interactions. 
And he wrote down all possible type of interactions based on the symmetries of the fundamental theory of QCD. And the theory is called chiral effective field theory because it includes as degrees of freedom, as we discussed here, nucleons and pions. And because the pions are the goldstone bosons of chiral symmetry breaking, we call this theory chiral effective field theory. Um, so Weinberg predicted the leading order interactions are just two body interactions. Then at next to leading order, so um, suppressed by two powers of momenta Q, uh, there are corrections to the two body interaction. Um, and at the next order, there are three body interactions and at higher order, there can be even four body interactions. And you can see here that this field has been making steadily progress by deriving uh, all these um, interaction contributions. Okay, so what's the advantage of this effective field theory? Um, the first advantage is that we include all the long range known pion physics explicitly. The second advantage is there's a whole bunch of short range couplings, which uh, we don't um, um, introduce through a model, but these couplings like in an effective field theory are fit to experiment once. So we could fit these guys here to two body experiments like two body scattering experiments uh, and the rest this could be fit to three body scattering experiments so we have a few short range couplings actually not many and there are some orders where there are no short range couplings at all and they are fit to experiment once and so then um, this nuclear chart that we discussed should come out without free param parameters without changing any couplings it's a, a systematic effect field theory. We can work to a desired order uh, up to NLO, up to N2LO, and obtain uncertainty estimates from what's left out through the EFT convergence pattern. Because it's a field theory, we know how to couple in electromagnetic and weak interactions, like to minimal substitution, just as in the standard model, except it's done at the level of the effective field theory. We also know how to match to lattice QCD, and we know how to not just couple to electromagnetic photons or weak bosons, but we know how to couple to any other probe that's outside of this theory to any beyond standard model particles, in particular to any dark matter coupling channel. Okay, so it's a real systematic organization, not just of the strong interactions in the nucleus, but consistently of how the nucleons in the nucleus interact with any external probe. And for every one of these, there's such a systematic organization principle. There's a leading order interaction of the nucleons with the external probe, a subleading order interaction of the nucleons with the external probe, and there can be also multinuclear effects at higher order. Let me draw your attention to something that's very interesting and maybe is also interesting um, uh, could be interesting to you, to you independent of uh, the dark matter stuff. Um, and it will probably start to play a role also for dark matter uh, nucleus scattering at some point. Namely, um, there have been a series of papers from about five years ago, which combined the systematic, let's say, Taylor series type expansion in Q over, in momenta Q over a breakdown scale. So you have sort of this momentum expansion together with a Bayesian um, statistics to provide statistically meaningful theoretical uncertainties. And this goes under the word of Bayesian uncertainty quantification or Bayesian statistics using EFT. And here you can see, for example, this is not dark matter nucleus scattering, um, but this is nucleus, nuclear nucleon scattering, cross section for nuclear nucleon scattering. And here you can see the essentially um, analysis of the data, which is the black line, the dashed line, black dashed line. And you can see the prediction of the chiral EFT at NLO with some uh, 68 and 95% uh, confidence interval using Bayesian statistics. N2LO green, N3LO blue, N4LO red. So you can see that systematically there are uncertainty bands. So we are in fact, in many places in nuclear physics, putting theoretical uncertainties because we know how the EFT works. Um, okay, so now we're at the level, let me go back, where we have 
have discussed the interactions between nucleons um, and this EFT expansion in terms of momenta, which will be important um, later. Um, uh, so then let me complete the tour. So now we have the uh, um, a picture of the interactions inside the nucleus. So nucleons inside the nucleus can interact through short range interactions, through pion exchanges, through three body forces, many different interactions. Um, so how do we describe nuclei then? And uh, I will uh, um, not discuss this at all. I just want to draw your attention that actually based on such two and three body interactions, we um, or the nuclear physics community has developed many different methods. Here's just some acronyms for these methods, which provide basically um, controlled uh, solutions of the many body Schrodinger equation uh, based on a given two and three body interaction. So for example, if you would say, I'm going to take interactions up to some order, plug them into the a Schrodinger equation to solve for the ground and excited states of a given nucleus, um, then this is what you would get for a particular interaction for the chain of ground state energies of the oxygen isotopes. And there are different acronyms here, which all solve the Schrodinger equation using the same Hamiltonian, but with this slightly different many body truncations. And you can see here from the overlap of the different colored symbols that the nuclear physicists can basically solve a 20 body problem with a 1% uncertainty for binding energies of strongly interacting nuclei. So this is not uh, yet for you maybe too interesting, but it's starting to be interesting because in, in this lighter region, there are a couple of nuclear targets for dark matter detection, which can be addressed with these methods in a what we call ab initio way, okay. Um, and then finally, two more advertisement slides for this. Um, so the real breakthrough of being able to do this, uh, to solve the A body problem for large A in a controlled way is um, not just computing power. So what we can see here is the heaviest, let's say the world record in solving an A body problem in nuclear physics went from the alpha particle a equal four to the longest time it was carbon 12 and you can see that if you put all these world records on a line it's basically linear the reason for this is that the algorithms used to solve the Schrodinger equation for these points use an exponentially scaling algorithm exponential in a and since uh, Moore's law also improved computer power exponentially if you have an exponentially improving computer power with an exponentially scaling algorithm, you are linearly able to get better in mass number. And essentially all of these methods that are quoted here and several others use now polynomially scaling algorithms. So they more efficiently sample the many body Hilbert space. And this has enabled, uh, this is a point from 2016 has enabled the calculation of uh, nuclei way beyond carbon 12, which you can see from here, because we still benefit from Moore's law, but our algorithms um, scale polynomially. So we are basically able to calculate uh, lots of nuclei. And we have calculated uh, in this paper here with Ragnar Stroberg and collaborators, we have calculated the 700 lightest nuclei in this way, uh, fully up in show. okay? Um, so this is uh, was supposed to be my introduction uh, to strong interactions. Um, and now I would like to tell you one other aspect of strong interactions coupled to weak or later the dark matter sector, which is important. And then I come back completely to dark matter um, stuff. Okay, so uh, I already told you, or maybe this is a good point where I can ask, are there questions? I can see uh, the chats, but I can't see any raised hands or so. This you would have to, for the photo, this you would have to look out for. I can see also any raised hand. Okay. So, um, so let me. Um, 
Okay, so we are now basically at the level of uh, having discussed the interactions between nucleons. Uh, and I've shown you that uh, nuclear physics has um, basically triggered by this interest of facilities and astrophysics to understand extreme neutron rich nuclei has uh, developed methods that can solve basically up to 100 nucleons or so um, at some level of uh, accuracy um, that we can discuss uh, later in the exercises. Now I want to come to what happens if you have a system of nucleons, which is depicted here, and you let it couple to um, photons, uh, weak bosons, um, or later on to uh, dark matter um, particles, to WIMPs. And this picture here is actually a picture for WIMPs coupling to nucleons, but here I will use it for uh, axial vector couplings uh, in the uh, for weak interactions so basically we are doing here beta decays okay so um if you have a this is a, this is a w plus or minus boson um and if you have a, a um any external probe that couples to nucleons i already told you that at the simplest level uh, this couples to a single nucleon and then we call this current current interaction a one body current at the nucleus level okay so it's like a one body coupling or at the um, a weak current axial vector weak current couples to an axial vectors hadronic current there's a one body current here and in fact for beta decays the dominant currents are one body currents they are they are at uh, leading order q to the zero at sub leading order q squared but if I go to higher orders, just like we discussed here for the strong interactions, when I go to the higher order here, in particular for axial vector currents for beta decays at the same order as the, where the three body forces entered, there is are also so-called two body currents, where now I have a, um, a, a W plus or minus that couples not just to a single nucleon, but it couples to a two-nucleon system. And this two-nucleon system is not just the product of two one-nucleon systems, but because of the strong interactions, it's um, so intertwined that it looks like a two-body current coupling. Okay, and there are two possible two-body currents that can enter. One of them is where these two nucleons exchange a pion, and simultaneously to the pion uh, is where the weak uh, boson couples or the weak boson can couple directly to two nucleons at short distances, okay? And uh, in fact, for the beta decay, and this is to some extent also the case for spin-dependent WIMP nucleus interactions, uh, these couplings, some of these couplings that are in here are related to the same couplings as in nuclear forces. And it turns out that for beta decays, all two-body currents um, are related to the couplings in the three body force okay so we can explore these two body currents and see whether they are really there or see whether we actually need this or whether we can forget about it and i just want to show you two examples that indeed demonstrate that we need it the first one is from the magnetic sector and the second one is from the beta decay sector these are both recent examples uh, so what is shown here is a plot of uh, the nucleus for the nucleus lithium-6. That's an alpha particle plus a neutron and a proton. Uh, uh, and lithium-6 in its ground state um, has a magnetic moment. That's the value of the magnetic moment. This is experimentally very precisely known. And it also has a magnetic dipole transition strength between the excited and the ground state. And this was not experimentally known uh, very well, but it was measured very recently and reported in this PRL this year. And you can see in calculations which do not include two body currents, which are the symbols down here. So which mean that the coupling of the photon is just to a single nucleon and the magnetic moment is essentially given by the magnetic moment of the individual nucleons. Um, that 
and that gives a proper value of the magnetic moment, but it does not correctly describe these magnetic dipole transitions. Okay, and if you, however, if you include the leading, excuse me, the leading predicted two body currents, then indeed you can, without adjusting parameters, the EFT predicts you, predicts uh, or postdicts or agrees with the new experimental measurement. Okay, so these two body currents, um, these um, facts that if we have external probes and they couple to a strongly interacting system, they can couple to a single nucleon or to nucleon pairs. Um, this is an important effect to describe nuclei and their electroweak interactions accurately. This was a magnetic sector. Here's a um, calculation for the gamma of Teller or for the beta decay of tin 100. A very interesting nucleus. Uh, and you can see that there's a range of experimental determinations here, which is um, a, a, a very an older one here and two more recent ones over here. So they point to somewhat smaller <coughs> matrix elements for this beta decay. This is the gamma of Teller matrix element, which is essentially related to the beta decay of tin 100. And you can see here calculations using different interactions, no parameters, just ab initio calculations using different interactions. And you can see that the inclusion of two body currents is very important and decreases the gamma of Teller matrix element and decreases this gamma of Teller um, um, decay. And we think actually that these two body currents here shown by the errors, this quenching effect is uh, necessary for what's known in nuclear physics as the quenching puzzle to describe beta decay. Okay, so all of the physics on this slide, uh, two, three body interactions and one and two body currents are important to describe nuclei and the coupling of nuclei to external probes. I will skip this in the interest of time, but you can ask me about some EFTs for heavier nuclei and which are related to two neutrino double beta decays and two neutrino double electron capture. Okay, so now um, I want to check off the first part for today, the, the half, first half of today. Uh, with this, I wanted to show you that um, nuclear physics has evolved into a field which is uh, very systematic using effective field theories and powerful many-body methods to describe nuclei. And um, this is very important for everything that follows because um, if you want to use nuclear physics input, you should always check that what you use is actually capable of describing existing data. Okay, so um, let me go to the dark matter um, side. Okay, so let me uh, briefly uh, say what I will focus on in the lectures related to dark matter direct detection. So we will assume the dark matter is particle-like, like a WIMP. And then for direct detection experiments, you are looking for WIMP scattering of, of nuclei. That's where this lecture comes in for nuclear physics. And you need as input basically uh, two points. Namely, you need to understand how to go from the fundamental level where the WIMP couples to quarks and gluons, the BSM level, beyond standard model level. And then you need to make the transition from these couplings in a systematic way to the matrix elements where the WIMPs couples to nucleons and pions, which are the relevant degrees of freedom for dark matter direct detection using nuclei. Right. We don't describe nuclei in terms of quarks and gluons, but in terms of nucleons and pions, as I just showed you. And this is uh, goes under the name nucleon matrix elements or pion matrix elements, hadronic matrix elements. And then you also need to encode the nuclear structure physics. The, how does the nuclear structure, the nuclear chart emerges? Because a nucleus is not a collection of A nucleons, but it's a strongly interacting system. And uh, this is encoded in the nuclear structure factors, or so-called nuclear response function, which is sensitive to nuclear physics. Now, um, if you look at the direct detection experiments and you analyze the expected recoil 
from a, a WIMP scattering off of a nucleus and change it to momentum transfer, then you actually find that the momentum transfer in WIMPs or dark matter particles scattering off of a heavy nucleus, like in this cartoon here, are um, of, uh, include momenta that are low, so rate for EFT, but may reach up to the pion mass. So it's actually perfect for chiral EFT. Okay, and actually we were triggered to look at this by a colloquium of uh, Laura Baudis in Darmstadt in 2012, and since then have been working on uh, deriving um, um, nuclear structure factors uh, and nuclear matrix elements based on chiral effective field theory to provide input nuclear physics input for dark matter direct detection. And this is here a series of references. I gave you the key references that we will discuss before. And I want to emphasize there have also been others who, of course, worked on um, looking at um, dark matter nucleus scattering. And this is very important that one includes this correctly, because otherwise, when there is a signal, you don't know what is standard model QCD and what's not standard model physics. OK, so let me put this here I'm going from WIMP quarks gluon couplings to nucleons and pions on one big um, energy scale. Oh, sorry, okay, tower of effective field theory plot. Uh, so uh, what I meant before is that we really want to go from the uh, BSM scale, where through some exchange particles, the WIMPs here, the excess coupled to quarks and gluons. Um, Tomorrow we will actually do this not from that level, but from the effective operator level, where we basically treat the exchange particles here as, as, as heavy. And so there or we just supplement the standard model by some higher dimensional operators, where the WIMPs still couple to quark and gluons. Um, then there are some, um, let's say, running, electroweak running, electroweak uh, physics to be included, um, to be more accurate. And then um, the, we go make this transition not to coupling to quarks and gluons, but we want to look at the coupling of WIMPs to nucleons or WIMPs to pions. Okay, and this is all the scale of the chiral effective field theory. And finally, if we have understood the chiral effective field theory aspect, then we also need to calculate the nuclear structure physics, meaning we need to look at uh, the nuclear wave functions and uh, um, combine this with the EFT operators. Okay, and with this, I would like to start um, discussing these two topics for spin-dependent nuclear scattering. But maybe this is another point where it's good to take a quick break and ask if you have questions. I see there are no no questions at the moment. Good. Then, Maybe uh, I can, I can yes. ask that of you in effective field theory approach, you make reference to the masses of nuclei, and then you uh, uh, discuss the quenching of uh, uh, in beta decay, but uh, and explain it with two body interactions, so with, uh, with uh, two body currents. So the question is uh, uh, did you try also to? Make reference to muon capture? No, not yet. This is what people are working on. Um, so that involves a higher momentum transfer and getting the co including the currents with higher momentum transfer is a little bit more work. So there are some calculations, I should say, for few body systems with muon capture by the PISA group, but for nuclei, uh, there are no uh, calculations yet. Okay, people are working on this. Okay, let me actually before I go here, maybe uh, there is some questions. Somebody is asking whether the mass of the mediator should be different from the mass of the pion. In the okay, effective field approach. Yes, I think question. in so, chat, there is, do you always assume that the mass of the mediator is of the order of the mass of the pion? No, we don't assume that. 
in fact, this is like the BSM scale here. So um, at uh, this is an even heavier scale. Um, and we will represent this part here through basically higher dimension operators to the standard model. So where the exchange particle is treated as heavy, much, much heavier than the pion. And it can for be us, raw meson. It's the repulsive inter or some other ways. Okay, thank you. I think your question was about why here for yes, the yes, heavy yes. people. Yes. Okay. For us, the mediators at this level here, of course, then there are pions. So um, yeah. So this is not. These are not pions. Um, maybe just to, so that we're all on the same scale with nuclear physics uh, and um, WIMPs, I thought I could draw a couple of simple pictures here on the iPad first before we go on to discuss um, spin-dependent WIMP nuclear scattering. I'm not sure how I will be doing time-wise, but I still want to try this. Um, so let me share here, switch to the iPad. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about WIMPs coupling to nucleons. Put in brackets and pions, but I will just comment on this in a second. Okay, so since Nucleons are, we distinguish uh, some couplings there. And since nucleons are non relativistic, they are all, bun oh, there are many, they have um, a spin, they have a momentum. Um, so there are many possible things we could couple to for the WIMPs to the nucleons. And in fact, you probably know we distinguish a coupling to an operator that's basically the identity. So let me one, or we could couple to the spin of the nucleon. So the spin of N is supposed to be neutron or proton, or we could couple to something that is momentum suppressed. We put Q to some power times one or spin. Okay. And I will not discuss these uh, today at all. These are momentum suppressed interactions. Okay, and in fact, they are much weaker than these two, although there are a couple of interesting responses here. Now, this is coupling to nucleons, so a single N neutron or proton, but for us, these are bound inside a nucleus. Um, Let me put some, these are supposed to be my nucleons. So these are N or P's and they have spin up and down. And sometimes in a nucleus, there's an odd, a single, for an odd number of nucleons, there's a single one, okay? So now if you have a coupling that's um, um, of this type here that couples to the nucleon without knowledge of its spin or its momentum. So then this coupling, you can basically in this picture here, couple to every nucleus, nucleon inside the nucleus. Okay. And um, in fact, this response goes as goes as the number of nucleons, A, and we call it a coherent response. And one type of coherent response is the spin independent response, SI. Now, because we 
here because of nuclear pairing So because of the interactions inside the nucleus, these spins always pair together inside a nucleus to form a um, spin zero pair, let's say. I'll make it here, J equals zero. Um, the picture is a bit more complicated, but for our simple picture here, iPad picture, that's good enough. So these are all my little J spinless pairs because of nuclear pairing. So if I have a spin dependent response, they still couple to all of these, but in the end, this pair here has no spin. Yeah. Sorry, let me then, so that you're not confused with J actually call it S. But because this pair has no spin, the um, response from this and this nucleon cancels. And in the end for, a spin-dependent coupling, we only couple at this simple picture to a single nucleon. So this response here is this coupling, this response of the nucleus is not coherent, but it's single particle. And you get an order one type interaction. And of course, you know this from the spin-dependent interaction, which we want to discuss. There's a question from Cora. Yeah, uh, sorry, I, I'm a little confused here when you say coherent because even for the spin dependent also, you are summing over all the nucleons. So you are doing something similar that you are doing for a spin independent. Then why it is not coherent? It is coherent, but it is canceling out, isn't it? Yeah, with coherent, we mean they, they all add together. And in this but case, they all, add in pairs to zero and there's only one response left. So the response of the entire nucleus has a similar cross section as if you're scanning off a single nucle nucleon. They still couple to everything, but it incoherently adds together. Okay. Okay. But they uh, still be are adding them. Coherent but for us in the lecture out. will just be it scales as the number of nucleons inside the nucleus or a significant fraction thereof. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Okay. So then um, it's clear that this coherent response will be much more important if then this will, will have a much larger cross section than the single particle response. So let me put some figures here. And it's also clear that anything momentum suppressed, unless you have very large momentum transfers, any momentum suppressed will be much smaller. Okay, so basically to organize you, momentum suppressed is really weak, single particles next largest and coherent is the, you get all the power of the nucleus because it scales with a number of nuclei. We don't get to this today, but at the end of tomorrow, I will tell you that in between here, if you have these nucleons exchanging pions uh, here, or there, we have if you have a coupling of WIMPs to pions, This gives you a response, which is somewhere in between scaling with A and scaling single particle like. So it's still with some fraction of the um, number of nucleons. It's a I question from Katharina. Uh, yeah, um, so on the right side, you uh, draw a picture of an odd mass nucleus, illustrative illustration. And if you have an odd odd nucleus, do the responses add up? So if you have an odd neutron and proton, then you will still pair the neutron and proton together for most nuclei. Okay. Um, and so then it starts to depend on the nuclear structure. 
Okay. Thank you. And, and, yes. And it, and it depends also on, then we have to distinguish, uh, that's a very good question, Katarina. Then we have to distinguish between the coupling to the WIMPs to the neutron or the proton. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So this is sort of our big picture for the, the lecture that we will start here at the single particle like cross sections. Uh, and tomorrow we do everything that's coherent because for this we need some more i want to do some more ipad framework and give you some some details but for this just remember that there is this interesting wimp pion channel and it's actually more important than wimp um, spin dependent wimp nucleon okay so with this i will leave this and come back to here so um Namely, we start with spin dependent WIMP nuclear scattering. So now what's important to me is that, um, unfortunately, for the calculations, I could also maybe do this here. So for scattering, this is proportional to the final nucleus, the operator that describes the coupling of the WIMP to the nucleon or to pion or to whatnot. Psi initial. Okay. And so this here we have derived based on Chiron EFT. But um, for Xenon, and most of my examples will be for Xenon, we can't calculate the initial and final state based on Chiron EFT yet. But here for these, we use. Uh, basically the nuclear shell model. Probably on a time scale of the next uh, few years, um, we will have a good handle of Xenon as well in Chiral EFT, and then one can do the combined thing in Chiral EFT and do order by order estimates as well. So now I just wanna show you that for the shell model, actually it can predict very well the structure of Xenon, Nuclei. So these are the two hardest nuclei, the odd mass xenon 129 and xenon 131. Uh, this is calculated based on a Hamiltonian, which is built from two body interactions. And then there are some corrections to compensate for things that can't be included yet. It has based on a very large diagonalization and is pretty good agreement for the theoretical spectrum compared to experiment. The, the lowest two states here are in the right ordering. Then there's the next four states are also here. And also you can see here that this triplets of states is there, the next triplet is there, and the next four states. So this looks pretty good. Actually, I want to encourage you that if you use nuclear physics for dark matter diag detection, ask the people who provide it for nuclear structure input, because uh, Here's a figure from a paper which I will not reference, just to not put anybody on the spot. But this is also what is considered a good nuclear calculation and provides some rates for WIMP nuclear scattering, the same xenon nucleus. This is the calculated spectrum from ground state up compared to experiment. And you can see here that the, um, the one 11 half minus state here, the next state isn't even in the spectrum. For the 131 xenon nucleus, the lowest states are not even the ground states. So there's you know, there, there are some non-trivial checks that you have to make sure that your nuclear physics colleagues uh, do before they provide uh, rates for dark matter diag detection. Okay, so then we can take these and look first at the nuclear structure factors or the response functions for this case where the coupling is to the spin so the coupling is uh, um, has a coefficient that we don't know because we don't know the wimp coupling and it couples to the spin of the nucleon okay and then to calculate the cross section for wimp nuclear scattering as a function of the momentum transfer p squared we have to go from the initial nucleus to the final nucleus which for elastic scattering is the same there's the interaction operator or Lagrangian in between. And then we have to uh, calculate the cross section. 
And we can turn all of this into using into a standard convention where this is involves the coupling of the wind to the nucleon. So this is like a single nucleon cross section times an axial structure factor or what is called the structure factor or the response function, which includes all the nuclear structure physics. Okay. And there are various ways to write the nuclear structure um, a factor here, SA. Either we can write it in terms of um, different multipoles. So this is like a multipole expansion. So then there are like, it includes basically all the different current operators, or you can de decompose it in isospin. So there's some isoscalar or isovector structure factors. For me, actually, the only thing I'd like to, that we just need is that we describe basically the cross section here as a standard single nucleon cross section sigma where a wimp happens to a single nucleon times the modification factor SA P, which includes all the nuclear physics. So to um, keep it in this um, overview here, this is the single nucleon cross section is basically a nucleon matrix element and the structure factor is the stuff that happens inside the nucleus. Or here, there's a matrix element which then defines the single nucleon cross section and there's a structure factor that defines, describes all the strong interactions inside the nucleus. Okay, and we can calculate this for xenon and this is for the odd xenon isotopes because they have even number of protons. So protons are fully paired and an odd number of neutrons. So for these xenon isotopes, the spin is mainly carried by this free unpaired neutron. And in fact, if you look at the response functions as a function of momentum transfer here in some units, um, then you can see that for xenon 129 and 131, the structure factor is largest for dashed lines, which is the coupling to neutrons. Okay. So, and in fact, at P, at zero momentum transfer, you can express it as the spin expectation values. But as I told you, WIMPs don't only have to couple to a single nucleon. But the WIMPs, when they couple to nucleons inside the nucleus, the nucleus also strongly interact. And for xenon, we have an, the, the unpaired one is a neutron. So the, the, the large response would here be this is a neutron. Um, that were the dashed lines before. So one of these has to be a neutron. Um, but we can also have a but we can also have in a nucleus a coupling to two particles so then we couple to a pair a neutron and a proton okay so while in the case where the single particle coupling is to the neutron the cross is already large and When we include these effects where WIMPs couple to pairs of nucleons, the, even if the coupling of WIMPs is purely to protons, it still talks to the neutrons and talks to the spin unpaired neutron. Okay, and this two body current effect here, almost done, Fedor. Two body current effect uh, is uh, something that. Um, gives an enhancement at low momentum transfer to the unpaired, um, to the to the paired species. So you can see that once two body currents are included here with the colored ones, then uh, even if you assume that the um, wimp couples only to the proton, this this line here, then um, then because of the two body current, because of this coupling where so let's say red is only couples to the proton. Then because the other particle can be a neutron, 
then even though the one body proton coupling is weak, the two body neutron coupling is not proton coupling is proton neutron coupling is not weak because the neutrons still know about the spin expectation value of the non-zero unpaired species. So you can see here that the response of the um, odd species follows very closely the, um, the response of the paired species follows very closely the unpaired species. It's just weaker because the one body response is weaker. Okay, so this enhances the coupling to the even species um, even in the case of, uh, um, uh, in all cases, in the case of protons for xenon. And we found this kind of effect in all isotopes for obvious reasons. So germanium gets enhanced from two body currents, aluminum, aluminum is dominantly protons, but the neutrons get enhanced from two body currents and so forth. And, um, um, and so, um, when we then calculated this, and we calculated these for xenon, and we're delighted that the xenon collaboration at that time in the xenon 100 limits immediately used our structure factors based on these Carl AFT one and two body currents. And here you can see the back then xenon 100 limit for the WIMPs coupling to the neutron. So that's the large species, WIMPs coupling to the neutrons. That's a large species. And also all later WIMP neutron plots were or limits by Panda X2, by Lux and by Xenon 1 ton used exactly the same structure factors. So this is very important because one compares this on the same plot. Okay. Um, so that really um, was great for us nuclear physicists. Um, and then I want to say, why, shall show you why that's important. If you now look at closely, look at the WIMP proton limits. This is from the Xenon 100 paper. Um, so you can see that for the WIMP neutron limits, Xenon 100 improved the sensitivity compared to Xenon 10 by an order and a little bit more in cross section. Okay, so one order of magnitude better sensitivity and a little bit more, maybe one and a half orders. However, if you look at the WIMP proton um, limits from the same experiment, going from xenon 10 to xenon 100, the order of improvement is almost two orders of magnitude. And this improved sensitivity is not because there was something special about the protons, it's because of this enhancement from the two body currents that the xenon experiment now becomes also competitive to WIMP proton couplings. Okay, and with this, I will check off this and leave this part for inelastic scattering for tomorrow. And um, just uh, keep you here the summary with thanks to collaborators and maybe leave this for you to read so that I don't take too much more time. Thank you very much for um, um, coming and I hope um, you have questions and I look forward to the exercises later.